Hello, good afternoon. I'm Eric Schlodenfrey. I'm representing the Department of Architecture here in the Faculty of Architecture. And thank you for joining us today for the dialogue with the Dean of Architecture. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the panel uh, here. We all have uh, heads of department and also Christoph Krola. Uh, Christoph is the uh, head of the uh, Design uh, Plus program uh, of the BASC program. Uh, he's a director for that program. Um, just to his left is Kelvin Wong. Uh, Kelvin is professor in real estate and construction and the head of the department. And to my left is Matthew Pryor, uh, who's head of the landscape, uh, division of landscape architecture. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to also welcome the, the dean of architecture today who's been able to join us, Professor Chris Webster. So we'll have a, a, a conversation more today as a format, uh, introducing different programs, but really focusing on the, the larger picture, the larger, bigger picture of why architecture is so critical in this part of the world. So could you uh, kindly start, Professor Webster? Thank you very much, uh, Eric. The, I'd like to start off with talking to you about the thing that really drives us in, in the faculty. Uh, faculty of Architecture is a faculty of the built environment. That's the uh, a faculty of human habitat. It's a faculty of uh, the world around us that we inhabit as urbanized uh, human beings. Uh, we are right at, at this point, at a very, very poignant moment in the, the history of human civilization. For the 50,000 or so years of modern humans' existence, civilization, and prior to civilization on Earth, uh, the humans have lived at very, very low density. Uh, Hunter-gatherers, uh, subsistence farmers in the uh, Neolithic and Early Bronze Age. Only very recently, very, very recently, people started to live in cities. And the poignant moment that we are at coincides uh, with your careers. The next 20, 30 years or so, um, is a moment in history in civilization that we have never ever been at before. And uh, if you've read the brochure, if you have the brochure in front of you, you might have to look. There's a um, what we call in maths or statistics a step function. It's a phase change. Um, for virtually 50,000 years, humans have been living at, at near zero urbanization. Within the course of two to three hundred years, that is risen super exponentially and by the end of this century by the end of your career over two or three hundred years we have moved from a non-urbanized to an urbanized planet now why does that matter why does that matter for uh, what we do as teachers researchers architects landscape architects planners etc what does it matter for your choice of career uh, well it matters because cities contribute to all sorts of problems. They are engines of growth, they are engines of welfare, they are a super blessing to humanity, if you like, uh, that have raised humanity out of the dust, um, but they also come with their curse. And what we do in our faculty is help manage that, that balance. Um, we train students to design, imagine, build, create, govern uh, the cities of the future. Nowhere like the present, it, uh, over no time recently, uh, ha have we seen um, the consequences of this. Um, we are in the present time that is also very poignant in the short term, uh, coming to grips with these issues. Uh, I was asked recently, um, what is the post-pandemic city of the future going to look like? Well, uh, let, in my students in our first year course, uh, I pose that back to them and say, what do you think? Uh, from my expert view and our expert views as urbanists uh, and designers, let me tell you that every time there's been a pandemic um, in the past, in modern history, in recent history, uh, cities have recovered. Cities are hugely resilient. Uh, they are self-organized, complex systems. Uh, urban planners, I'm an urban planner and urban economist, uh, like to think we can manage cities. Uh, I've got two architects sitting either side of me. Architects like to think they can design cities. 
Let me tell you, as you know from your experience probably, cities take on a life of their own. And 1665 and 6 were two very bad years for the city of London, where I come from, where my colleague Matthew comes from. I'm from the north of the Thames, he's from the south of the Thames. Uh, we'll ignore that difference. Uh, there was a plague which wiped out 20% of the population of London, 1665. The next year there was a fire of London, the Great Plague, the Great Fire. What happened when architects, uh, planners as they were then, engineers, surveyors, got round to rebuilding London? Let me tell you, in terms of the shape, nothing. Uh, there were a few very nice new architectural inserts, acupuncture development we call it these days, but broadly the city of London got rebuilt on the same early medieval grid that had, uh, the plague had worked its way through. So cities are very resilient, something like 95 plus 98% of European population live within um, one mile of a medieval church in Europe. Things don't change. What, what, what can we do? What can you do? Uh, pandemic is just one existential issue. The other, ch climate change, energy. Uh, cities and buildings uh, create something like 36% of the energy uh, output uh, coming associated with the anth Anthropocene. Um, what can we do? Well, if you were going into medicine, some of you are probably considering medicine, uh, you would go through a, a learning system, um, a sequence of, of your education that goes from something like anatomy to pathology uh, to prognosis to diagnosis. And that's exactly what we do in each of our domains. Uh, the anatomy of the city, the cities that are in the process of housing virtually 100% of the world's population. What is their anatomy? What are the urban dynamics that keep them working? What is the urban economy that shapes the transactions that keep cities so robust? Uh, we teach you that in urban studies. So I'm shifting now to a slight focus on urban studies. Um, in our urban studies degree in particular, although in other subjects too, you'll, you'll get this big picture. Uh, what, is, what is the anatomy of the city? Uh, you will become experts on human habitats, how to double-guess them, how to invent the future uh, in more ways than simply imagining it as an expert of city processes. Um, pathogens um, and the problems of cities. Pathogens in medicine, there are pathogens in the city. How do we spot, monitor, how do we make cities greener, uh, more smart? Um, how do we then diagnose the problems as uh, professional urban planners, uh, urban managers? How do we use massive uh, urban data that's now available with us? Uh, 5G, 5G uh, networking capacity, modern urban computation, um, blockchain technology, modern sensors will revolutionize the cities in your generation and make them smart. How do we harness that technology uh, to make cities, to moderate the negative effects um, of cities. Prognosis, diagnosis. Uh, so that's what you'll get in urban studies. You'll get something very similar. Um, this is a hugely important field and uh, we'd love you to join us um, in our passion for saving the planet our way in, this, in these respects. Thank you very much. Thank you. It has me also thinking about the realm that public health has in place within our cities as well. And I know that you often work with different people globally looking at issues around public health, both in terms of our sort of short-term health, but also in terms of chronic diseases as well. And that cities are often seen as a place where maybe exercise might not happen, or we might be less healthy, or we might be more healthy. And the research that you're doing also starts to reveal things that we might make as an assumption, test those assumptions to see how we can redesign our cities. And I was wondering if you could just speak for a moment about that before we move on into real estate and construction next. Sure, uh, f fascinating. I, I was talking to uh, the chief engineer of 
Hong Kong's new Lantau Island uh, yesterday, uh, a whole bunch of engineers. Um, and I posed the question to him, and this is what you might do if you become an urban planner or an, an urban designer working at that scale. What shape is the island going to be? Uh, answer, or rather the, the, re the, 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 quest the reason behind that question is because it matters for health and it matters for energy. Shape actually matters. Uh, we did some in interesting research recently on density in the United Kingdom and asked what is the most healthy density to live at. The most unhealthy density to live at is the typical British leafy suburb. <laughs> um, if you move further into dense cities, um, people tend to walk more uh, and that has a measurable impact on the probability of getting heart disease, the probability of getting obese, etc. You could never design a city to optimise heart disease uh, because you'd not optimise something else. But this is the science that you need to know in order to make uh, informed decisions as designers and planners. Thank you. Can we turn next to Kelvin Wong um, and real estate and construction? So yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, so I'm Kelvin Wong from Department of Real Estate and Construction. Um, so in our department, we have uh, an undergraduate program called BSC Surveying. And I think the keyword for today from Professor Webster is that uh, we are building the city of the future. And this is not uh, completed by a single discipline or profession. So that's why surveyors, for example, work very closely with architects, with designers, and with urban planners, and urban managers, and landscape architects. So we all work together, but then uh, at the same time uh, for surveyors, uh, they also take a very uh, special role in, in, the, uh, in building the city of the future. So, um, so although we call ourselves a BSC, so Build Bachelor of Science, so we are in fact more uh, interdisciplinary than, than, than what you know, the degree name has implied. Um, so in, in our degree uh, course, uh, we will uh, cover actually quite a number of uh, topics, including law, management, economics, and technological innovations. So that means, you know, no matter you are from a science and art or business background, you, know, you, you might be interested in us because we cover such a wide issue. Because when you build a city of the future, you have to take into account all these legal issues, uh, of course, you have to deal with money, right? Because there are a lot of stakeholders in the development process, and also you have to manage the expectations. You know, manage you know the uh, all the stakeholders in, in the city, and and finally, you know, as uh, as uh, Professor Webster, uh, Chris Webster uh, talked about, we also focus now more on uh, technological innovation. So even in the construction and real estate industry, we have a lot of new tools. Uh, maybe blockchain and, and also IoT and other stuff that we are also, you know, trying to incorporate it into our program. I, I actually come from the U.S. Yep. and so I spent a long time in New York City over a decade. And one of the things that impressed me most when I first came to Hong Kong 13 years ago was how technologically advanced the whole city seemed to be. And often in America we think of New York as the technologically advanced city. But even friends who visit now are actually incredibly impressed with the innovation that happens here. And often it happens here first. And I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about what is happening in terms of innovation, in terms of our built environment. What is, what is our future uh, coming to? So, I can, so I, at least I can inform my friends in New York. Right. <laughs> so I think there could be like a two uh, aspects of it. So one is more on the construction process. So in the past, you know, as uh, uh, Professor Webster said, you know, when we build a pyramid, <laughs> then we may, you know, need a lot of setting out and, and things, you know. It's, it's the same for modern buildings. So if you have to build a high-rise building, you can imagine, you know, how difficult it is to coordinate different parties. So we have an architect, designer, you know, who, who do the plans, and then we need uh, some construction workers, engineers to make sure that the, the buildings will be safe there. And then, so, so who, who will be coordinating all this? So in the past, we will have you know, uh, project uh, managers. Uh, they could be architects, surveyors, or urban managers. Um, but now, if we talk about technology, then we can actually change the weight of uh, thinking of the construction process. It is it's not that linear nowadays. So it is more like, well, this is the final product we want. So we may not build everything on site now, for, for example. So we may actually build something in a factory. Right. We well design everything, we produce everything to, to every detail, 
and then we transport that to the site. So for that to occur, I think there will be a lot of technological input to, to this you know, coordination. And, and of course, in our industry, that, that will be called BIM, so building information modeling. So that will become a key part of the industry, not just in Hong Kong, but I think every part in the world. Yeah. So the conversation I had yesterday with the chief engineer of Lantau Island, so this is a new town, uh, possibly 250 to 300 million uh, uh, thousand people. Um, yeah, <laughs> in, used to dealing with 100 million. So. <laughs> yeah, I used to working in China, uh, mainland China. Uh, so this, but this is a big deal for Hong Kong. Um, when we were talking about shape, um, I suggested to him that the, the most optimal engineering shape is a circle. That's because the area to perimeter ratio of a circle is the most efficient, it's the most efficient ge geometric shape, if you like. So if you wanted to minimize engineering costs, um, which is something you might study in, in Kelvin's department, REC, uh, that would be the shape. Um, if you wanted to maximize the value of this land over the life cycle of the city, uh, you would want to take into consideration real estate value, uh, mm -hmm. the, the land values that created, mm -hmm. and the optimal shape for that is something like a starfish. Um, uh, hence you see a lot of um, artificial island developments, Dubai, etc., looking like a starfish or something even more bizarre, like a map of the world. Um, uh, the, the, response, the response of the engineer was, actually, the shape is going to be defined by sea currents. Mm -hmm. That's something we'd probably study in mm -hmm. architecture and, and urban planning. Um, so I said to him, coming back to your point, Eric, um, if you were able to model the city in a building information modeling uh, system, BIM model. Um, so you had a digital twin, a digital twin of the, the buildings and the entire new, new system, uh, new, new city si system. Then you can actually project, you could model over the entire life phase and you could work out the balance between the additional engineering costs of veering, going away from a circle with the additional benefits over the life cycle 100 years, 200 years, of going more towards the star, uh, star form, form of island. You can only do that if you've digitally modeled your design, the object of your design. I really appreciate the idea of also looking at ocean currents, because that way we could actually start to reconsider how and who we are designing for. We often think that we design for our humans, but when you're modeling ocean currents, you could actually start to consider uh, reducing the ecological impact that we would have on other species. And I think as a, as a human um, sort of species, we should start to reach out to the other species. We should start to think about how we create better ecosystems, not only for those species, and of course, to protect those species, but also for ourselves. That often we think of the world that we try to control benefits by always controlling the hardscape but reimagining how we actually control uh, and work within an ecology, because we also know that stress levels come down, we'll live longer, actually, with it more uh, greenery, um, that if we live more uh, in a symbiotic relationship with ecology, it actually will make us happier. And so there's a lot of considerations that we think of uh, to optimize, but sometimes to aim to optimize ignores some of the critical elements about what makes it human for us in the habitable. So I was hoping to turn now to Matthew Pryor, looking at <laughs> landscape architecture, <laughs> ecology, um, some of these other wider issues that make I, our cities pleasant to live in. I was going to say, you know, I, I've been a landscape architect 30 years. And the, the, the question I always get is, that, you know, what, what, what does a landscape architect do? But you've just given it a very, keeps a, us alive. A, a, they keep very, us alive. You've just given the, this, this wonderful description of, of what we do. Um, landscape architecture is really uh, focused on two things. One is the environment and the other one is community. And how do we use our, our design skills, our planning skills, our, our construction management skills to try and negotiate the best arrangement between uh, environment and community? How do we create that environment that makes us healthy, uh, that makes us happy, that, that sustains natural systems? I was very intrigued, you know, the, the, the islands being shaped by ocean currents. A lot of what we do is shaped by the, the natural 
landscape systems or the, the natural systems we have, whether it's uh, in response to the climate or the hydrology or even the underlying geology, which is a, a big factor here in Hong Kong. Um, landscape it, it sees, and landscape architecture sees the city in terms of these systems, starting uh, bridging in scale, not only from, from the object and the site to the district and the territory, right up to the country scale, so that we un understand how they all fit together and how all the, the forces and the, the dynamics uh, influence each other. And as we seek to build things and to intervene, we understand what those impacts are going to be, the impacts on environment, uh, whether that's ecology or climate or you know, our water systems, and also impacts on our communities. The other, the other question I get asked all the time is, OK, we, we understand what a landscape architect does. What does a landscape architect do in Hong Kong? I mean, you look out the window, you think, where, where, where's the landscape gone? And of course, I, uh, my response to that is an easy response, is that, yes, landscape is a, is a very challenging uh, discipline in Hong Kong. But we have a lot of opportunity. We have a great deal of need. When you get to this level of density, um, the efficiency, the engineering efficiency can make us physically very healthy, but we have great challenges on mental health uh, in terms of the, the way that we live so close together, the fact that everything is managed for us, you know, our environments are highly prescriptive. And landscape architects are now engaged in looking to see how we can uh, design and work with architects and planners uh, and surveyors to make the city greener and healthier and more relaxed and more happy and looking at the social benefits and how can we use what we see out of the window, how can we see all these building surfaces as sites of production, how can we make energy out of it, how can we make food out of it, how can we capture water or sequester carbon. So the landscape architect um, will look at Hong Kong and say well, this is a land of great opportunity because we can see that at this extremes of density, um, we have a real challenge of balancing environment and community and making sure that we sustain both equitably and not just thinking about this year, next year, but thinking about these sort of 20, 50, 100 year timelines and how if we make a change here, it's going to influence there. If I have flooding in the middle of the city, maybe my solution is right up in the country parks. I need to plant more trees up in the country parks to buffer the movement of water in heavy rainstorms. We can only, only get to that point if we understand it all as a system. So you're, you're quite right, the ecology and the, the environment, very much uh, central to what we do as landscape architects and draw us together with all the other built environment disciplines. And I know you've been doing a lot with the rooftops. And the reason I love rooftop uh, farming <laughs> so much is that, well, one, it, it takes away the, um, the energy because actually if we heat our rooftops uh, because of the sun, it reduces the solar gain. So it drops the, the temperature um, off the rooftop. It makes it easier to air condition our spaces mm -hmm. using less carbon footprint. Yeah. But also we can visit the rooftop. <laughs> it's much more accessible for a lunch. And also, we can farm and eat our lunch from the rooftop. I, I have once or twice eaten, eaten my lunch entirely from the rooftop. I, I got my <laughs> students to, to build a rooftop farm here at Hong Kong U. That was about eight years ago, and it's still going. It's part of the, the general education initiative here. And it's about 400 square meters, and there's about 100 people involved, open to anybody. And it was, it, was, it was a project to demonstrate that we could do this and to understand the, the technical difficulties of constructing or retrofitting uh, a rooftop farm onto a, an existing building. But that led on to a, a whole series of research studies, uh, really asking the question, why do people do this? Why, why, why does everybody want to go and farm on the roof? And we did, did all these fabulous surveys. We went around and asked everybody. We took photographs of everything. And the, the conclusions that we came to were that the, the rooftop farms produce very little in terms of food. But what they do produce is enormous amounts of happiness. You, you visit any rooftop farm, any farmer will produce three small tomatoes and will tell you over the course of about three hours, 
how he grew these tomatoes and you know, the, the, the love and the effort and, and he'll show you the, the website, the Facebook website that these tomatoes have and you, you just the social benefit, the, 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 the empowerment of being able to grow something and to interact with nature and, and to, to participate in a project with uh, colleagues and make friends and learn skills, fabulous. Yes, we've got all the, the green building benefits, you know, the solar heat, uh, uh, mitigating solar heat gain and noise and capturing water and everything else. But this, is, this I think, is one of the things, one of the insights that our sort of research produces, that um, maybe we shouldn't look at the rooftop farm as a site of production in terms of food security or uh, food health, but maybe we should be arguing for it in terms of social benefit. The fact that people really enjoy being up there and it's right in the middle of the city and it's very healthy. So, so interestingly enough, I, I, I think mm. I'm the only person in Hong Kong who grew up on a farm mm. um, in the middle of rural, rural America. You would be surprised. And the one thing <laughs> that I love, actually I have met other people from my state and my state is entirely rural. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so yeah, there yeah. are, oh, boy. I yes, can't yes, be the yes, only yes. person in Hong Kong. <laughs> However, one of the things that I always loved about mm. growing up on a farm was that every birthday we would plant a tree. Oh, so, yes. And you choose your tree. So I, I, one year I chose a cherry tree, one year I chose a pear tree. The reason I mention this is because you have a different connection with your environment. When you're participating in your environment, Excellent. when you're growing things in your environment, you feel both mm. happier because mm. you actually your attention allow something else to survive, which is actually somewhat, I mean, we've, as you pointed out, we've been living our whole uh, civilization, 50,000 years of living with farming, with growing things and being very close to nature. It's only very recently that we've actually changed into becoming uh, urban. And let, let, let me add an interesting <laughs> fact to that before you move on to architecture. The, um, the design of the classic Greek and Roman buildings with the portico and the columns and things typically follow what's called a golden rule that you'll learn about when, uh, if you come and study with us. Um, there's been some recent uh, research that shows that the explanation for that golden rule, the golden rectangle, uh, 1.618 uh, is, is the fractionality, um, has arisen in human cognition. We think that's a beautiful dimension, uh, mainly because we are farmers and hunter-gatherers that have evolved on a plane, and this is the optimal way of scanning the horizon, given uh, s speed of vertical and horizontal scanning in, in the eye. So, yeah, even, even a rural background determine what we see as beautiful in architecture. That's actually the frame, almost, of the, uh, of of the, the 16 screen. by 9 of yeah. the screen. Mm. And actually, that frame was interesting. Because, oh, sorry, my film back. I have a film background <laughs> as well, a PhD in film. And so what's interesting about that frame is that they experimented with every type of frame. It used to be 4 to 3, which is more squares. And then for in the 70s, they really stretched it out to go beyond your vision. But we, we actually came back to that frame because it's actually comfortable for us. Mm -hmm. And these things that you think, uh, your phone, the TV screens, the computer screen, you think that that proportion comes out of some sort of technological need, it comes out of us. Mm -hmm. We design for us. And so these worlds that we create mm -hmm. need to be constructed, need to be optimized for the islands, need to have this mm -hmm. concept of how greenery plays into it and is very close. So Absolutely. I think the challenge for the future isn't to live within a mile of a church steeple, uh, <laughs> but to live within 10 feet mm -hmm. or within the same footprint of, of greenery in order to actually have an opportunity to still return to our roots in a way. And I think this is particularly important for uh, the, the, the uh, low-income groups, the, the aging society for young people. In Hong Kong, the young people don't really get many opportunities to touch the soil, to, to engage with nature. Put it on the roof. Uh, particularly if you can have some sort of intergenerational aspect to it, so old people, disabled people, sort of people who are otherwise don't have other uh, places to go. Um, it becomes this, this sort of commons, this beautiful commons area. And it's just out there. It's just right in the middle of the city. In terms of how this relates to architecture, I've been thinking about mm. this quite 
deeply, actually, because Hong Kong is often seen as, as sort of a laboratory. And it's often seen as a laboratory for the future of the city because Hong Kong is one of the few places on earth that actually urbanized 100% urbanization first. And we have very dire needs in our city. We have to house seven, seven and a half million people in a very small mm -hmm. amount of area. So I think the question that really comes from an architectural perspective is this question of how do we imagine our future and what do we need to change in order to do so. And I often think of architecture as one of the most intellectual tasks on earth because not only does it have a mathematics and a science to it, but it also has art and humanity. And we're actually knitting together not just one area of knowledge, we're sort of knitting together all these areas of knowledge. And I was just reflecting because we, we just published our this year's prospectus. Um, so this year's prospectus, you can actually get it. Uh, we have it in the Department of Architecture and the Faculty of Architecture as well, or we can send it to your school. And what it is is actually both a prospectus looking into the future, but it's a review looking at the past year. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's been a very difficult year from many perspectives, mm -hmm. but it also allows you to re-question what the future holds. Yeah. And actually, even reflecting after the Great Fire of London, there's this aspect after the Great Fire of building the city slightly differently in order to, well, at one point, make it more fireproof, <laughs> uh, which is important, so to learn from past mistakes, but at the other end, to also try to reimagine the public spaces within architecture and to give more public space mm -hmm. as well. And I think it's this idea of architecture's role, not as a single building, mm -hmm. but as the public space to gather, mm -hmm. and really a reflection of humanity. And I think there's a huge advantage within architecture of really reflecting on this concept about how architecture isn't just about giving the base survival of a place to sleep or a place to work. Mm -hmm. Architecture really needs to aspire beyond just the building into reaches of our society. And the other aspect of this is that in the last 20 years, China has added around um, 300 million population to its cities. Just for a pure sort of comparison, the population now of America in 2020 is 331 million. So that's like building America, every road, every building, every hospital, every school, every workplace mm. in a span of 20 years. Mm. In order to do that, you, you think in a very sort of um, dire way because you actually try to collapse and, and make it a economically viable because they didn't have the same budget that America had 200 years to build America mm -hmm. and a much different budget and a much different time frame. So in order to accomplish this, you have to think very differently. You have to think in terms of how you um, have a, a base, a prototype, and then replicate. And my philosophy is, and I think for our department, is that we need to rethink that prototype. The prototype that it's based on today, it was 1922. So it's 98 years we've been following that same prototype, more or less, of the, the, the cruciform tower. And I think that prototype is, is vastly out of date. And I'm beginning to think, what are we going to do? 2022 is almost here. So we have two years to work on this problem and come up with a vastly different prototype. And in many ways, that's what this prospectus and this review is about. It's actually not proposing a building. It's thinking about architecture as a prototype, how we design something that then goes on to affect 300 million people. And as our world urbanizes, I believe by 2050, it's uh, 3 billion people is predicted to have become urbanized, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so what that means, and if anyone else corrects me if I'm wrong, but that's the number I have in my mind uh, for 2050. So if three billion people are living in cities, what this means, actually I think currently three billion people, it's kind of, it's, I, it's I think more, we're, we're heading towards another it's, it's three more, billion by 2050, exactly. is the number I have in my mind. Uh, so we're heading to another three billion. Um, so what that means then is that we're designing this prototype that gets replicated. That's going to have a vast impact on our world. And it's not just the spaces that we need to live in from better mental health with less stress levels. It's also these spaces that we need to think about, as I was saying, this balance in ecology. And if buildings uh, take up 36% of all energy use on Earth, 
it's 39% of the carbon footprint alone. So the building and the construction industry is 39% of the carbon. So our responsibility is vast. And our effect on, on just not one person, or 1,000 people, or 10,000 people, we're now thinking about what we do as architects is going to have an impact on the globe. But we need to work together. But we need to work together. Which, which is why we have the, the Design Plus guys giving us the interdisciplinary. And also, that's point. why we also move within scales. We move mm. from urban planning to how we construct our buildings, to how we uh, interface with the, with the ecology and the environment, to how we design mm. for our cities. And moving into Design Plus, it's a new program that mm -hmm. was started two years ago. Uh, Christoph Krola is, is leading this effort. Yes, hi. Um, Thanks, Eric. Um, so yes, I'm Christoph Kroll. I'm now directing the Design Plus program. And we've, we've been through this presentation in some form or format a few times, and I always find it very, very difficult to come in and present a Design Plus because I'm an architect. I'm a practicing architect as well. And here I am presenting a program that is not architecture. That's totally different. Um, and, and, and why would there be a need for that? So maybe a, a good way to say it, I have three boys in kindergarten, and I was recently in conversation with Eric, and apparently we figured out that you know, like every parent, you, you're imagining what they would do when they grow up. Two out of my three boys will have a profession that doesn't exist today yet. So as Dean Repster was saying, if you look at the speed of urbanization, it's basically this jump if you look at a 300 year period in which this urbanization is taking place. But it's more than exponential in its speed. So the acceleration of these changes that we're seeing today are much faster than they were 150 years ago. So this rapid change in our environment has a huge impact on the professional industry as well. So why was Design Plus uh, created specifically to tackle that gap that we have observed in the professional industry? Everybody has an idea of what an architect is, uh, or what a, what, a, what a surveyor is, or maybe what a, uh, a landscape architect is. But if we know now that in 10, 15 years, the whole professional landscape is going to change. How, would you, how do we train people for that landscape? So the Design Plus is specifically created to basically sculpt the leaders of the future that are going to be equipped with tools and techniques and a mindset and theories and experience to be able to be nimbly responding to that changing landscape. That's what the plus means. It's design plus whatever's coming at us. So uh, it's a brand new program. We're now in our second year. Uh, it's a Bachelor of, Art, of Arts and Science. And the main goal of this program is to uh, create the innovators of the 21st century. It's mirrored to some programs that you may have seen in the uh, West Coast in the US, for example, that have been at the core of the sprawl of innovative companies uh, in Silicon Valley and, 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 and whatnot. There's many, many examples. But Hong Kong, as a geographic location, is now at the core of the, pl the, the human planet, basically. Within a five-hour flight radius from where we are, half of the world's population is living. Um, in, in, uh, with Hong Kong as a core here in the, in the Greater Bay Area, this is going to be the first city of 100 million people. So what better place to be than here today uh, to participate in this, uh, this great challenge? So that's where the Design Plus program came in, because we thought that there needed to be an other answer as well, in addition to these existing programs. So what we're trying to do in the Design Plus is basically um, train people in design in its broadest sense. It's multidisciplinary, it's interactive, it's technology driven, it's technology based, um, but it also has all its different sub focuses. And we want our students to basically find their identity and their passion within the program by allowing them to also pick from the vast opportunities that we have in the curriculum across the university. So uh, we have a strong core curriculum uh, of four years that's driven by design, where we give them all the tools and techniques to develop their basic skill set. But they can choose their own major or minors in addition to that if they have a passion for fintech, for example, or artificial intelligence and machine learning, or marketing, or structural engineering. All of those different disciplines can be combined with the philosophy and the mindset of design thinking so that they can become these new professions uh, that we don't know of today. And just listening at the earlier conversations, quite a few have been uh, mentioned. Uh, for example, 
uh, a maritime computational fluid dynamics expert who would be analyzing ocean currents and be able to be able to create uh, simulation models that would allow us to predict shapes of these islands. Um, none of that existed 20 years ago. Uh, a BIM specialist, that didn't exist until 15 years ago, and now uh, they play an instrumental role in the built environment. Um, same with, with uh, any types of, of, of uh, app design, for example, or, or game development, or augmented reality and mixed reality being kind of the latest hot thing that's coming into the conversations as well. So what we're trying to do in Design Plus is create this environment where we're basically we're basically uh, joining our students on this journey to explore and be open to these new information that come in and then mm -hmm. together try to come up with uh, questions and also answers to how we can contribute most of that as designers in addition to what architects or landscape architects or, or urban planners or, or surveyors can do. So that's why we're still within the Faculty of Architecture because a lot of the design uh, at Hong Kong U is actually centered there so it's a great place to be and a lot of our students also overlap with students mm -hmm. in the other courses. Um, but so what we're trying to do is basically tap into all the resources that we have available and create these brightest entrepreneurial minds that are going to be the, the, the visionary uh, inventors of the 21st century um, that are going to lead our way forward. The, uh, may I? The, the, I? I love your interpretation of the plus. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was one of the originators of the, of the idea. Um, actually, as, <laughs> as, was was the whole team, as was Matthew. And, and the plus was definitely then uh, design plus engineering plus economics plus biology. Uh, yours is a much better interpretation. It's design <laughs> plus whatever's coming at you down, the, the down from the future. Yeah, uh, and that, I love that. Uh, so the, uh, from the faculty-wide point of view, we are we're moving very solidly in a multidisciplinary trajectory, and I know some students you, you're very uh, very interested in this. Uh, we're particularly interested in students who who can perform at a very high level on both sides of the brain, left and right, uh, linear, uh, nonlinear, complex, uh, re reductionist. Um, so the the idea is really to. Uh, enrich the community uh, within the community of students within the faculty by this really different forward-looking innovative uh, people who spend half half their time in a uh, history lab uh, class half the time or half the time in a economics or physics lab and half the time in making spaces or uh, we have what we call in the faculty on the seventh floor silicon corridor uh, well, we, uh, uh, clever colleagues in REC um, are making very interesting technological IoT devices. Uh, lovely. Okay. Mm -hmm. I actually I love the program so much that I'm teaching the the core history course for it as well because I, it actually touches upon a lot of my uh, own. Uh, research uh, and also my own background in terms of the PhD and Matthew was also instrumental uh, so it was, it was actually a, um, a, a deep collaboration to actually uh, realize it and it wasn't just a collaboration within the faculty we actually we've reached out across the university we, we partners are right across the unit from education to law to finance just a, a and I love the, the the whole concept of founding the, the, these future professions on design thinking. We don't know what they're going to be, but they need to have the, those core skills and competencies that will allow them to grab the opportunity. And we've been also reaching out for this program very specifically regionally. Uh, mm. Some of our teachers are coming from yes. around the region and also globally, because this is becoming more and more an effort globally. Design is becoming much more important. And it isn't the design of a tangible object. It's really this way of thinking, mm -hmm. and this sort of more philosophy about reaching beyond But I think in really realizing any work, it's really about extending beyond what we know as well. Yeah, the multidisciplinary nature is, is at the core of it. And one of the important aspects of the courses I'm teaching at Design Plus is how data and the management of it and act, having access to it can become a new language that allows multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. There's maybe one point that I want to add to it. Uh, and later tonight, we're doing some presentations of the programs as well, where we'll have the slideshows. 
Um, and one of the graphs that are really fascinating in that is about the value add of design and how you see that from uh, all the design graduates. There's a chunk of people that still do traditional design work, but a vast majority of them become incredibly valuable in all kinds of disciplines outside of the conventional design world. And that realization that the mode of creative thinking, the, ca the capacity to bring people together around the table and guide them in decision making, bringing these disciplines together, is so much at the core of what is needed today in any profession that a, a graduate from the Design Plus program, I believe, will have a huge market value uh, mm -hmm. afterwards as well because of their versatility and because it will allow them to uh, um, develop their own persona and their passion more forward. So we have time uh, for a few questions. And also the, the event that Christoph is referring to. So at 6 p.m., we have an event within the Department of Architecture, but also with Landscape and Design Plus. So uh, hopefully you can also join us at 6 p.m. So that's completely separate from this type of panel. And we're also diving a bit deeper uh, and more specifically into some of the programs. Uh, so we can start to take uh, questions from the audience. And I can start to see the, the question that comes up uh, is the first one, is why is interdisciplinary learning important and how is it relevant to our future career? I think because Christoph just answered that in a, in a way from the design perspective, perhaps we can start to think about this from another perspective. And I know in REC, you already mentioned, Kelvin, this concept that it's also looking to the legal side. It's looking into the coordination side. That in, also, I can imagine the amount of time that's spent um, in terms of planning uh, a construction. I wonder if you could speak a bit more about this into the disciplinary nature. Yes, I think that the second part of the question actually answered the first. So it is actually very, very important to the career because when you graduate, you have to work with many different people who are from different backgrounds. They, they could be designers, they could be future innovators and urban planners and landscape architects. And they, they are from different backgrounds and they will look at your project or your, your, your buildings you know, from different perspectives. So that's why you know, if you know, when you are coming to us, uh, study for four years, you have exposure to all different sorts of students here and different sorts of professors. Then you will know, okay, oh, architects will think in a certain way, and maybe uh, surveyors will also think in a different way, and urban planners you know, another way. Then you will know, well, from different ways, then you will know, you know when you talk to people and how the best way you communicate your ideas with others. And at the end, you know, we want to create positive social outcome. I think that is also you know, our, our topic for today. And, and I know as an associate dean uh, for teaching and learning, you also started a, a faculty into the disciplinary course as well. And so yes. it also spans beyond and brings us all together in a way. I, it, I think it's fundamental to what we do. The fact that you, know, we, we, you can describe us in, in terms of the, the sort of traditional disciplinary heading. But in fact, there's so many uh, things that join us together and that we intersect together, not just in terms of processes, but things like materiality, um, the, 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 the way that we conceive things. And it seems to me that in future, we're really only going to be successful if we can work as a team and collaborate as a team. And the idea behind the, the, the sort of first year interdisciplinary courses was really this, how do I build a team? How do I work as a team? Uh, I'm a landscape architect, but to be an effective landscape architect, I need not only to be able to speak planning and surveying, but I need to have that network. I need to be able to call on friends and uh, when I have a project, I know I'm not going to be able to do it uh, by myself. I need to have all those friends, all those contacts, and the language. I need to be able to speak other people's languages, uh, disciplinary languages. And so we, we have the, the FICs, the, the Design Plus, I think, has, a, has that at its very core. And the interdisciplinarity is not just in terms of the, 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 the way that we teach, but also in terms of the students and the student mix uh, and the, the pedagogical mix and the fact that we look outside the campus so often to, to try and engage with, with different communities and different geographies. So we, we, there's become very much a focus of what we do uh, within, across the entire faculty. A, a word, if I may, a, a, to historically mm. place that. At the very earliest stages of human civilization, at the uh, early and middle Bronze Age, um, Big buildings, monumental buildings, uh, were built by single uh, experts, if you like, 
uh, surveyor, they were surveyors, architects, engineers, all rolled into one. Um, they could do it. The, the project was, was simple um, in that sense. Uh, 6,000 years on, uh, 5,000 years on, uh, production of the built environment, the creation of that human habitat that suddenly engulfed the world's population into cities from nothing um, is multiple, multiple times more complex. Mm. And uh, no individual person or profession can have that themselves. So we, it's not just that to be a successful professional, you have to network with each other. The, the whole process has split up into multiple, multiple parts and expertise. And so we have to work together. We aim to train you uh, in that respect to become successful uh, built environment professionals for the future. I actually really love this idea that we rely on one another. It's not just about working with one another. It actually is about how one discipline relies on all the others. And not just within the built environment, but within law, within medicine. We can't keep a, a person healthy unless we have a healthy city. Um, and so all these professions and actually all our thinking uh, actually relies on one another and effective communication. Also, cities are a great generator of wealth. They're a generator of wealth because they're bringing people together. They're providing opportunities to meet and to actually share ideas. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that, that came uh, from uh, is another one that says, perhaps the landscape architecture can be a result of the, uh, to reflect the identity of the human in this land. Mm -hmm. For students, do you think that the architectural education makes them establish a close relationship with the environment or give them creative ideas to build the land? And I'd have to affirm that this is actually how we're thinking towards the future. And I think that even 10, 20 years ago, we wouldn't ask ourselves this question, nor would the great mind who would hopefully want to grab into mm -hmm. the profession, such as a student, actually ask such a question. And I think that it's showing a reflection that these are not singular tasks. These are shared tasks. Yes. And it's through our communication with one another that actually we're able to address it. So I, I would say wholeheartedly. And I think there's a huge movement within mm -hmm. architecture to think not just about our building mm -hmm. sitting in a landscape, but our building as a landscape. In fact, one of the buildings we just completed, uh, I also have an architecture office, and one of the buildings we just completed was the world's first upside down um, uh, landscape in a way. Actually, we wanted to keep it just ferns, just raw nature in a way. Um, but because it was a spot in the city which you wouldn't be able to have much landscape. So we looked for every opportunity to bring it in. And in many ways it re is a reflection, a true reflection of how the landscape students and the architectural students uh, work together and also the design and real estate and urban. But we also even share a floor for one of our mm -hmm. studios. And so they interact in a very strong way. But of course all of this is a reflection of the, the, the urban community that you design that building in response to uh, the, the, the community needs and their, their desire for identity and for, for function and facility. You know, it's not just a, a, a pretty shape. It's based very heavily within environment and community, and I think all our professions uh, are founded in that way. I think maybe something to add to the question as well. Um, it, it's, one, uh, it's one thing to, to think like that, but one of the things that we're doing throughout the whole faculty is uh, also uh, uh, trying to bring the students the tools and the techniques and the methods on how to do that and train them on how to become experts in achieving that goal through design studios and through creative work, which is a very, very uh, fun thing to go through as well. It's a very stimulating exercise to go through because I can imagine if you're entering, uh, maybe you're an 18 year old or 19 year old considering coming to the faculty, it may all sound nice, but the question can maybe be, how do you do that? And it, it's actually really worth looking through the perspectives that Eric was holding to have a look at all the techniques and methods and creative exercises that we, we create for students to train them for that and how in those techniques um, we're also always trying to bring in the latest technologies uh, so that you can have that vision uh, and take that with you forward or after you graduate. Uh, another question has just come on the screen uh, that relates to this. Uh, as you were talking, it reminded me of 
the importance of experiential learning mm -hmm. in the faculty. So I'll just say a, a word about that, I think. Somebody's asked, what's the highlight of undergraduate learning in the Faculty of Architecture? Uh, well, each of our undergraduate programs um, has a very strong em em emphasis both on problem stroke project based learning in the studio um, and also on outside experiential learning. Uh, one of my favourites, we seem to be talking a lot about landscape <laughs> this time, but that, that probably says something to, uh, to students that's important, um, is landscape architecture's uh, programme over the last uh, five, six, seven years in Southeast Asia. Uh, working in Myanmar, um, in, in the city of um, Yangon, uh, which is a hugely flood risk um, city on the Irrawaddy River. Um, how, do, how can that be planned and designed at a site level, building level, and whole metropolitan uh, planning level to minimize uh, flood risk? Um, in a human in, um, human nature interactions, negative interactions, um, we take our student landscape takes its students to the along the Belt and Road Initiative Route Number Six, coming down from Yunnan in southwestern China to um, Laos, Cambodia, and then to northeast Thailand, working on practical problems, uh, working with communities. Architecture takes its students into rural China, building rural schools, bridges. We've got several award-winning um, architectural interventions into the beautiful landscape in uh, Fujian province up in the mountains. Uh, and it, it's amazingly inspirational for our students to go and work with some of the, um, I, some of the best minds in, in the world um, who, who will teach you if you come and uh, study with us, uh, working with local people, uh, local communities, urban and rural. Urban planning um, takes its students into mainland China, um, uh, to Europe. We've worked in Poland, um, Australia recently. Um, re real estate. Oh, one other thing to say there, we've only got three minutes left. Um, it's probably to flag up their overseas exchange. Um, so year three in our program is uniformly reserved for um, a semester out. An increasing number of our students spend time in Europe. Uh, majorities tend to spend time in uh, UK and Europe, some in the States. Um, but a lot of our students spend a semester abroad um, studying in some of the best universities um, and some of the most exciting uh, and, and locations. We also, uh, send students uh, to international competition. So just before the pandemic, uh, we sent a group of students to Vancouver uh, to participate in the international real estate uh, case competition. So there will be such opportunities. We also have been offering courses uh, that are located in Paris um, and also Vienna. We have ones this summer coming up that are located in Norway, uh, looking at Scandinavian architecture as well. So more and more we're working within the region, within Taiwan and Japan um, as well, and then also expanding outwards every year. And what this is um, also giving us is this amazing opportunity to intersect with other minds around the world. Um, and architecture and also everyone in the built environment, really has this amazing uh, ability to look at the problem from a different perspective, to look at it from a European or from South American, or to look at it from the perspective of Russia. It actually allows you to look into how we can change our own cities, and also, probably equally important, is what we can offer. Because again, we're at the cutting edge of urban living. And so what we can offer uh, as I opened up earlier, what we can offer New York, <laughs> what we can offer the rest of the world as well. So we have uh, just one minute left. Uh, so I just would like to thank everyone on the panel. I greatly enjoyed. This is actually why I love the Faculty of Architecture. It's because it is the conversations like this that one shares our own disciplinary knowledge, one reaches out beyond ourselves, and really, we can have this amazing dialogue, in fact, and see how each discipline 
effects uh, impacts each other and really working together in order to, to have a new vision for a new world. So just to also say again that at 6 p.m. we have another event for the Department of Architecture featuring landscape, architecture, and also design plus. And there'll be more events throughout this year. So please join us for those future events. Thank you very much uh, for joining us thank today. You. And thank you. Thank you.